Okay, we're recording. Well, good afternoon. It is January 26, 2021. And this is our first Twin Cities Growers, Metro Growers Network meeting for 2021. Uh, 2021 has just got to be a better year. Uh, and we, <laughs> we all got to do our part. My favorite quote from last year was, uh, we can't all be on the front lines, but we got to get up the sidelines. I thought that was pretty good. Um, and uh, so we had a pretty good year last year with the Metro Growers Network with uh, figuring out this online platform. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, my, my name is Carl Hawkinson and uh, I'm with the University of Minnesota Extension in Hennepin County. And I spent a lot of my time uh, with uh, what we call the Emerging Farmer Realm and also Agroecology and I partner with Sustainable Farming Association on this Twin Cities Growers Network. Um, and I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'm gonna share screen here. And boom, can you all see that? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is where we're at today. We're going to uh, meet some new farmers in town and uh, we'll go around and do introductions in a bit. Um, and I wanted to show you, uh, do, 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 what else do I have here? Um, I wanted to show you this. Bear with me here. Um, since we're talking about uh, emerging and beginning farmers as a resource on the network resource page uh, that I put together, uh, which I think are some of the best resources. Um, I can, I can, um, or if Katie, maybe you want to post that link up here in the chat. Um, here are some books and things, and then training. Uh, a lot of these institutions you'll see familiar, um, including SFA and the University of Minnesota, NRCS, Compere. We've got the Young Farmers Farm Commons, if you want to learn about farm law, Department of Ag, uh, et cetera, and so on. So some good resources there. So basically, the farmer, uh, this growers network was uh, a way to bring people together peer to peer um, and uh, talk about all the issues around growing. Uh, and uh, I, I picked this idea up years ago when we worked with grazers networks. Back in the 90s, the farmers were really interested in managed grazing, uh, grass-based agriculture, and uh, nobody knew what to do. There was no expertise, and so we just got together. And it's just a great way for adults to learn and share, and all about networking. Of course, Mr. COVID came to town here and kind of screwed that up, but uh, you know, technology uh, has sort of saved the day, I guess. <laughs> and uh, but it's uh, I want you all to uh, uh, share and get to know each other and in the chat share your emails and uh, so today uh, we are going to uh, meet the good folks Chris and Ashley at California Street Farm uh, a true uh, farm in the urban realm and uh, they're going to tell us a little bit about how they came to be and and uh, how they got started and uh, their markets and so forth. Katie, why don't you start out? <clears throat> sure. Uh, my name is Katie Federal. I'm the communications director for SFA. So like Carl mentioned, we partner um, with Extension to put this network on. Um, SFA operates quite like this networking group where it's peer-to-peer, peer-to-peer, farmer-to-farmer. Um, and we provide a lot of uh, different educational active uh, opportunities, events, um, helping promote research and all things around sustainable farming and regenerative farming too. Uh, we have nine different regional chapters around the state. And so they're kind of like this group where they're uh, except geographically located. Um, and I got connected with this group because I'm based in the Twin Cities too and started attending uh, the network as part of SFA and is just interested um, in what we got going on here too. So there's even if you're, you know, a, a home gardener versus a farmer, or you're just interested in um, promoting local food, sustainable foods and egg, uh, there's a spot for you at SFA and 
we have an annual conference coming up that you can, I'll put a link in the chat to that so I don't take up too much time here, but that would be um, kind of the next big opportunity to connect with um, folks like yourselves. Well, thanks. Yeah, and uh, uh, we're going to be hosting a session at the Sam Farm Association with uh, some of the new and beginning farmers. Thank you, Katie. And uh, let's go to Tom Peterson. Tom, you have something to do with agriculture in the state, don't you? I do. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Peterson, the Commissioner of Agriculture, and I appreciate the opportunity to join you today. I uh, had a little break, and ag comes in all shapes and sizes in Minnesota, and checking out the California street farm. And you guys will have to invite me out uh, when it's warmer to come visit. So uh, always uh, good to see all the different types going on today. So glad to join you for a little bit today. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. And uh, great stuff going on at the Department of Ag. So now, uh, Chris and Ashley, the proprietors and farmers of uh, California Street Farm, uh, if you could uh, take it away, tell us about yourselves a little bit and uh, your <laughs> operation. And uh, if you, if anybody has questions, you put them in the chat, and then later on we can open it up and and kind of go back and forth more. But uh, uh, Chris, Ashley, welcome. We're so well, excited to hear what you have to say and uh, take it away. I think first and foremost, thanks everyone for being here. I'm like already, my face hurts from smiling, just hearing like all the cool stuff that's going on and, and it's amazing to have everyone here. So thanks for taking the time and doing another Zoom. <laughs> um, we appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm Chris. And Ashley. I'm Ashley. <laughs> um, we, we normally would love to, you know, host people at, at the farm, but obviously yep. that's not, not doable. So we did put together some, um, some slides just so we can kind of like walk through what it is that we're doing and everybody can kind of see some pictures of the farm. It's um, <clears throat> never a better time to look at pictures of a green farm than in the middle of January. So absolutely, I figured it would give a little bit of context to kind of what we're doing. Um, we'll give you some background on kind of how we farm, how we got to California Street, the practices we follow. And then, yeah, I mean, obviously there's a great group here. So we're excited to, to talk and, and have some some conversation following. So we won't, we won't take too much time just kind of um, talking at you. Um, just to give you California Street Farm at a glance, um, we farm on a quarter acre of leased land um, in Northeast Minneapolis. Um, we mo mostly grow vegetables and we try to keep those vegetables as much as possible in the community. So our farm's located specifically on 22nd Avenue, Northeast and California Street. Um, right across from Mojo Cafe, pretty close to places like Psycho Susie's and Hi Hi if you're in the neighborhood. Um, we were super fortunate to find California Street Farm. We did not start California Street Farm. Um, the farm was actually started by a couple of friends of the landowners um, named Jim Bovina and Julia Pacenda. Uh, they started it in 2012 and um, ran it for, I believe, three years. I, uh, I'm not 100% certain on that. It may have been four years. Um, essentially, they left it in 2015. It sort of lay fallow for a couple of years. Um, in 2018, there was a, a couple who kind of gardened for themselves on a small portion of it. And then we took it over um, in the spring of 2019. So we're coming up on our third season growing um, at California Street Farm. Um, to give you just one more kind of high level overview of, of where we sit, um, you can see on the left, that's about how far we are from downtown. Um, and on the right, um, we have a, a, an outline of where our um, uh, kind of our land is. So um, you can see we're kind of sandwiched between a few different things. On the, on the east side, we have uh, a, a railroad track and then um, Botano Park. Um, so we get to listen to lots of soccer games while we're out um, working in the field. On the west side, um, toward the south, there's kind of a big empty lot, um, which kind of has some pros and cons. Um, in the winter, it becomes a big pile where the city dumps snow, um, which is obviously less than ideal. Uh, and in the summer, it's kind of a ragweed factory, um, which is also less than ideal. But um, there's some nice things about it as well. Um, we, we don't have too many direct neighbors. Um, and the ones that we have are great. And, and we have a little bit of room to roam, so we can kind of you know dump some some you know, cabbage debris in the field and not worry about um, making anyone mad. Just to answer a couple. The uh, the building is just to the north outside of the picture, right? The yeah, so that picture was looking this way um, and the building. Yeah, this, this photo is a little bit old. Actually, it's taken from Google Maps. So there's now, I don't know if, can you see my cursor? Yep. 
So there's a big rabbit statue right here, uh, <laughs> 22 foot, I think, tall rabbit statue now. And then um, these are kind of our, this is our first year bed layout. We've since um, filled this whole green border pretty much um, with, with beds in our expansion. Yeah. And uh, to answer your question, Carl, the, the folks who own the land have the building that's an arts building across the street. And that's where yeah. Mojo Coffee is as well. Right. Um, one common question we get is how we source our water. Um, there is a hydrant down here at the end of the dead end. Um, we have a water permit, a uh, hydrant permit through the city of Minneapolis, and we run that water kind of around the end of the dead end and then across the empty lot using a uh, three inch lay flat hose. Wow. Um, and then the farm is all on drip irrigation at the moment. So we run a couple of lay flat headers connected to drip lines that, that um, irrigate the different beds. Um, <laughs> It's a great location. We really love being there. Um, you know, we have great neighbors. We're near the park, so we see people coming and going all the time. Um, and uh, it's been it's been fun so far. Um, so Ashley's going to talk a little about how we got here. Yeah. So we um, we moved to Minneapolis. I'm a Minnesota native. Chris comes from the East Coast, um, but we moved back to Minnesota in. 2015? Yeah, fall of 2015. Fall of 2015. And we're lucky enough to find a, a place to live in Northeast that had a wide, um, a wide lot and some existing garden beds. So what you see on the left in 2016 is kind of where we started back in the soil. We were moving from Brooklyn, New York. So very much missing having our hands in the dirt um, and kind of dove in um, with full fervor and grew as many things as we could in our garden and put garden beds in the front yard and garden beds in the side along our driveway and just kind of like anywhere and everywhere we could in our yard and quickly realized that this is something that we both love doing and would be interested in kind of growing beyond just the scale for ourselves. Um, so started like reading books from the library um, listening to as many podcasts as we could, starting to, you know, take advantage of great organizations and folks in the, the metro and Minnesota area to learn as much as we could. Um, and 2018, I decided with Chris's support to take the leap and quit my, my um, design job that I was working at full time and go work at a farm at um, Prairie Drifter Farm out in Litchfield, Minnesota. So we figured initially we were thinking, you know, farming is something we want to do maybe when we get to retirement age and then we were like why would we wait <laughs> so we figured if it was something we thought we really wanted to do might as well try it out um, before we both left full-time employment um, just to you know kind of see what it looked like to work on a work on a farm five days a week um, rain snow sun, everything. Um, so that was an incredible experience. Um, Nick and Joan Olson who run Prairie Drifter are amazing people and um, their farm positions are also kind of a mentorship. They, they talk to you about learning opportunities and, and host different learning sessions throughout the season. So that was a great spot that um, Chris was also invited to come to some of those kind of evening classes. So we both got a chance to learn and think more about what we wanted out of farming. Um, and we were gonna go back to Prairie Drifter um, that next season. And as, a, as kind of a perk of a returning employee, um, Nick and Joan offer the opportunity to grow on a quarter acre at, at um, their farm. And then we found out we were expecting a baby. So uh, Nick and Joan astutely advised us, um, you can farm while you're pregnant, but you might not want to do it while working for someone else. Um, so we that kind of took us on our different direction, um, looking for land. Uh, and it was a real scramble um, in that, that winter of 20. 19, 2018? Yeah, winter going into 2019. Yeah, so we were looking everywhere, high, low, calling people. Um, and we'd seen the California stream plot before, seen it live fallow, um, and identified that as kind of a top choice for us. Um, we were also looking at the, um, the community garden lease program, kind of anything and, any, and everything we could find. Um, but we managed to, I think Chris called Jennifer, who owns the land, um, at least once a day for like, maybe three months straight until she she relented and and said she would listen to our pleas um so yeah super lucky that she decided to give us a chance um grateful to chris for that and of course like acknowledge our privilege and all of this of like being able to live in northeast and have that connection um so feel very fortunate still to be able to be the ones on this land um and i guess one note before we move on one of the reasons why we kept the California Street Farm name is, um, you know, as we look forward, we 
we see ourselves maybe more moving to more of a rural, rural environment. Um, and it felt right to keep the name both to honor what Jim and Julia had done in the past and to kind of leave the door open. Like we see ourselves as temporary stewards of this, this land and place and hope that we can find someone else to step in and keep the momentum going once we, um, if and when we move on. So California Street Farm um, is a little bit of us for now, but hopefully a legacy that kind of keeps going. Um, just a little bit more about how we farm. So we're uh, growing diversified vegetables. Um, obviously it's a, it's a pretty small space. So like the what's in the fenced in area is just about a quarter acre. Um, Chris mentioned it's leased land. It's, we lease it for a dollar and then two CSA shares um, for the building owner owners and then their administrator. Um, we both have full-time, well, at this point, not full-time. Chris has a full-time off-farm job. I did at the outset and now have kind of scaled back to do full, mostly full-time farming in the summer um, along with childcare and then a little bit of freelance part-time work in the, in the winter as time allows. Um, and we track our time pretty closely just to understand where the time goes since there's not enough of it. Um, but it ends up being about kind of 30, 20, 30 hours a week in the off season and 60 hours at peak um, across the two of us. And then in terms of how we're growing, um, we're really trying to strike a balance between planting intensively and getting as many vegetables for our neighbors as we can while um, taking as good of care of the soil as we can. So um, trialing different no-till methods and following organic practices and then trying to carve out space for things like pollinator plantings, perennials, those kinds of things on the farm as much as, as, much as we can in our very small um, footprint. And we're not certified yet, um, I would say mostly because of the cost, but- um, One rather than three years. Yes, yeah. Um, but that may be something to consider in the future. We've had challenges with spray from the neighboring railroad. So um, that would be something that would be beneficial for us to think about certification. Um, so um, as far as what we do with those vegetables, um, we currently sell at two markets per week. Um, our primary market is the Northeast Farmers Market. That's where we started our first season. Um, and then as, uh, as, sorry, I think Julia maybe mentioned, um, we did add a pay what you can farm stand this year. So that was something that, um, you know, looking at the season from March and April last year, we kind of didn't know what would be in store for us. We didn't know what COVID was going to do to farmers markets, if farmers markets would even be open. We knew that people in the neighborhood would, would probably be in kind of tougher spots um, financially. And we wanted to make sure that you know, we weren't just kind of growing veggies and then shipping them out. <clears throat> so we established a Monday farm stand from four to seven, um, where we do have a pay what you can model. Um, basically, all of our prices are suggested prices, but um, people are welcome to pay as much or as little as, as they like. Um, and in our experience last year, um, you know, our biggest challenge was, um, was getting people that needed it to the farm stand. And that's something that we're kind of looking into um, for, for next year. It ended up kind of coming out pretty even. Um, we had a little bit of a surplus this year that we donated to Every Meal, um, a, a local food shelf. Um, That's formerly known as the Sheridan story. Right. And then, um, yeah, we're certainly interested in hearing more if others have, have followed that model about kind of how we can promote and, and get the right people to the right place and kind of make sure that we are um, serving a need in the community because it's something that we feel pretty strongly about. Yeah, I, I guess just to expand on that a little bit more too, part of our challenge was last year, such unanticipated demand, both at the farmer's market and at the farm stand, um, to the point that we didn't even market the farm stand at all. Like we were just selling out, we were selling at the farmer's, selling out at the farmer's market, doing a whole new harvest on Monday morning, which was not necessarily something we planned and then selling out of that produce again. So our hope this year is that we can grow a bit more and I mean, hopefully that demand also stays strong with COVID, who knows, um, but we hope we will have more at the farm stand and as a result, have the opportunity to market to folks who, who need the access um, to fresh produce. Um, as Ashley mentioned, we grow diversified vegetables. Um, I think by our count this year, we're growing 43 different vegetables and fruits. The fruits are mostly melons, although we have some berries that we mostly eat ourselves. Um, we grow 10 herbs as well. And as Ashley mentioned, we have some pollinator plantings and some perennials. So we have a pollinator flower patch and we, we 
do I, you maybe saw it in one of the earlier photos have flowers at the end of every row, which we, we found really helpful and, and also very aesthetically pleasing last year. Um, and then we have a, a, a small, uh, probably a 20 foot as asparagus patch. And um, we put some raspberries in last year as well, which we're hoping will will take off and will augment this year. Um, wide variety of stuff, um, mostly for market, but we do try to carve out some limited space for um, either stuff that we really like or, or stuff that um, we want to try. So last year we grew some, um, you know, some experimental corn that we never brought to market, but we, we just kind of grew for ourselves. Um, we have some things like sweet potatoes that um, our son really likes to eat. And so we, we grew a lot of them and didn't sell any of them because um, we, we wanted to keep them for ourselves. So um, it's kind of a, a constant balance of um, making sure that we're leaving room for those kind of experiments and learn learnings, but then also um, trying to produce as much as we can um, for market. And then maybe a, a slightly less glamorous peek behind the scenes at what um, what happens in terms of harvest and post-harvest handling. Um, so we do our washing at the field. Um, we have a greens tub and then a spray rack that we set up under that tent. So trying to just keep things shaded and cool as much as possible. Obviously we try to work quickly during harvest. Um, we are FISMA Food Safety Modernization Act certified. So we have got our eyes on, you know, things like hand washing, regular sanitization of everything, um, looking for any evidence of wildlife, which is not as great on our farm as it might be rurally, but certainly the occasional critter or pest to watch out for. Um, and then also just like keeping an eye on, on field heat, obviously like not having, um, so we, we cool things at our home, which is maybe eight, 10 blocks away from the farm. Um, so we wash and pack at the field, um, start early in the morning, hydro cool a lot of things, and then move them into the wax boxes, which we then load into um, an old, a very old fridge that came from Craigslist and then a newer upgraded fridge that we got last year because we were running out of space um, from Mississippi mushrooms, which um, unfortunately lost their space. So we got a good deal on a fridge from them. So this is what it looks like to wash and pack. Um, and, and is a pretty accurate representation of what our season was like last year with uh, a, a baby between the ages of you know six months and a year kind of adapting with him. So if anybody has advice on the next year of, of farming with a baby, we'd, we'd love to hear it. You get a leash. <laughs> yeah, we are lucky both from a rabbit pressure perspective and from a child pers child safety perspective that the farm is fenced. So thank you to Jim and Julia for that, for like so many reasons. Yeah. And where is uh, this uh, pack shed? So that is our garage, which is another like super lucky thing that we have. Oh, okay. um, the, the previous owners built the garage and like made it very large. And um, yeah, we've just kind of, we sweep it out and tidy it up and treat it like as much like a pack shed as we can um, in, in the summer as possible. So that's, yeah. yeah, it's not perfect, but it sort of works. You can see yeah. like our snow blower in the background. So it's a little um, not perfect. So I guess just very briefly to kind of step you through visually where we where we started and where we've come to on the land. Um, so in spring of 2019, um, really late actually, I think like end of April was when we finally heard um, mid April yeah. heard back that we would get access to the land. So we scrambled pretty quickly to kind of clean up beds and. Um, this is essentially what we inherited was these shorter beds, like around 15 feet each, and there were maybe 12, 12 of them. Yeah. Um, so two rows of them, and then kind of the idea of a third one, but it wasn't quite fully formed. And at that point, um, I was pretty pregnant, and we are like risk averse people generally. Um, so we thought about the season as a chance to like very trepidatiously stick one toe in the water. So we plan to do six markets kind of every other weekend um, at the Northeast Farmers Market. And part of that was also just like knowing how much time farming can take, but wanting to from the outset like um, consciously preserve some kind of work-life balance. Um, so that was a good way to start that season was just like learning and starting super small. Um, and then 2020, obviously last year was like a huge year of expansion. So we took um, those kind of walking rows, the north to south walking rows and 
pulled that pulled those out, connected the beds to be 55 foot long beds and, and built, I think five more or so um, to get us to 20 in the main field and then expanded further south and made a, a very rickety um, caterpillar tunnel and um, some kind of trial beds further south, which Chris will talk about um, what that looked like. But um, last year was a lot of bed creation and um, learning both the, the good and the bad of what that, what that looked like. Um, and last year we put in the pollinator planting and some more perennials and wanted to kind of balance out you know, all we were doing in terms of intensive veg with a few things that would persist for a while. Looks like um, you're, one thing, it's a wide open place, tons of sunlight. You don't have any shade to worry about. Yes, that's true. We get, um, you can see the tip of the garage from the neighbor's place um, there, which is actually kind of perfect for the farm oh. stand. We get, we catch a bit of shade for our tent um, on Monday afternoons, but it doesn't do too much um, to hinder production in the bed. So yeah, it's, it's a good spot um, from an urban's perspective. And then as we're thinking about 2021, um, last year we sold at 14, 14 weeks um, at the Northeast Farmers Market and did the same thing at the farm stand. And so we're planning to do that and add a couple weeks probably on either side of that. Um, and really for us, the focus this year is like improving, kind of tuning the dials on some issues we've had with germination um, and pest management. Um, probably irrigation related to germination challenges, our, our soil super sandy and pretty low in organic matter. So just kind of trying to address that, focus on that and um, continue to experiment with intercropping um, with cover crops and um, cash crops just to, to keep building soil fertility while also meeting demand in the, from the neighborhood. Um, so yeah, this was us um, in the fall, we scattered some milkweed seeds in the empty lot to kind of maybe, maybe we'll complement the ragweed at the very least. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. But um, yeah, lot, some big plans for, for this coming year. Including a, a legitimate cat tunnel that we're going to get a, a full size 50 foot caterpillar tunnel. This yes. Yeah. Um, we wanted uh, to just dive. Oh, sorry. Are you getting assistance with that through USDA or? We are, that is on our list to investigate. So okay. if anyone knows about that, either hit us up offline or share with the group if that's of interest to others. With Daniel we, online here, he can help you out, I think. Okay. Awesome, that'd be great. Yeah, we, we, it is very much on the top of our to-do list. We so. built the last year's tunnel we built from a friend's art project. Um, she had some discarded PVC and plastic and um, it was from the Greenway Glow um, art installation. And it was, Lovely to reuse materials, but an incredibly bad idea um, <laughs> in terms of supporting the, the load of rain and um, doing what a caterpillar tunnel should do. So that's a recommendation to folks out there is like, don't <laughs> yeah. invest in strong materials. Yeah. Um, we thought we'd kind of just dive quickly, the, the one deeper dive into creating new beds, because it's something that we've had to do a lot of and thought a lot about and have tried a few different things just talk about like our process of opening up um, grass and, and turning it into workable beds as, as quickly as possible with, with, you know, an eye towards minimizing soil, we, we um, or soil dis disturbance. Um, we've tried a lot of different uh, methods, including uh, shoveling, broad forking, silage tarping, layering compost and cardboard um, mulches. Um, in 2019, this is basically what we walked into. Um, so, you know, lots of debris from the year before. You can see this is the area that Ashley called kind of the idea of a bed. It was mostly um, grass. And that has maintained, or has continued to be our hardest problem is quackgrass. Um, we have a lot of quackgrass on the farm. So if you don't know quackgrass, you consider yourself lucky, but it's it's rhizomatic. So it's, it spreads through the roots. And so you really can't, if you just chop it up, it, it kind of just comes back multiplied. So um, the first year we, we were literally down on our hands and knees, shoveling out the, the top couple inches of soil, shaking the roots as much as possible to get as much soil out of the big root mat from the uh, quack grass, and then um, discarding the quack grass rhizomes elsewhere. Then we would broad fork the beds and add compost. Um, you can kind of see this last bed here is one where we did not shake out the rhizomes. We just put cardboard and compost down, trying to kind of shortcut that process. Um, and it did not work very well. What happened was the quack grass just kind of grew up and around the, the cardboard. I think if we were doing it again, um, 
we would try to layer thicker cardboard and more compost to really smother those. And our, our cardboard didn't necessarily cover the sides of the beds. But in our experience, quackgrass is pretty gnarly and, and will kind of punch through quickly that cardboard as soon as it gets wet. So um, really need to explore some kind of more extreme options. Um, in 2020, we, we kind of revised this process. We did a similar thing. We started with a silage tarp though. Um, so we put a silage tarp down. We, we didn't get it down in the fall, unfortunately. So it wasn't on for as long as we would have liked, but we put it down as soon as the snow melted and probably had it on for about a month and a half in the spring. Um, which did a pretty good job of at least knocking back the quack grass and making it a little bit easier to do that hand pulling. Um, we were also lucky that we weren't doing nearly as much. We were kind of just taking those big strips, those kind of walkways that Ashley mentioned from the first year um, and uh, building a few more beds. But we did eventually um, break down as we were kind of moving south along the farm. We had a few more beds that we needed to make and we um, were just not going to get there in time to get the crops in. So we ended up renting a sod cutter for a day um, from Home Depot. Uh, would not recommend it also <laughs> unless you were really time strapped. It's like a beast of a machine and really to get the quack grass you need to go pretty deep. So we were really pushing it to, don't tell the Home Depot people, <laughs> we were pushing it to its limits, you know, going as deep as it could go, which I think is three or four inches actually. Um, uh, re realistically, you're getting the top two inches. It becomes really heavy. It's super um, hard to move. You're, it's very body intensive. Um, and then what we would do is that same kind of cardboard compost, broad forking, um, process. And not to mention we were taking all like the good fertility on right. the top. So like we were trying, we were focused so much on the quack grass roots um, that we, I think took a lot of good stuff out with it too. Yeah. So those beds last year struggled for sure. Our hope is that um, we will be able to continue to add organic matter back in and get some more production out of them. Um, certain crops did better than others, but it, it certainly was a challenge. Um, this year we are lucky to only have a few beds that we're trying to make to expand. Um, we're, we're running out of room on the farm to expand. So um, those areas we've already silage tarped in the fall. Our hope is that that will make it a lot easier. We put the silage tarp um, on actually in the... Oh, right, sorry. In the spring. Right, we put it in the spring of this year, of 2020. So it's been on for the full season and we'll take it off when the snow melts and, um, and get in there and, and see what, what it looks like. But um, I love this photo on the left. This is a wheelbarrow full of quack grass rhizomes um, that's taken from like probably about 15 bed feet of one bed, um, just to give you kind of a, a scale of the, the quack grass that we were dealing with. So um, that's where we are with bed prep now. Um, the, you can see these are our beds in the north, which are probably our nicest beds. We still do put um, a little bit of composted poultry manure and compost as well as um, mulch as we use um, straw and burlap in the walking rows um, to kind of try to keep the soil covered and, and keep weed pressure to a minimum. Mm -hmm. And we plant covers in the fall, typically oats and peas, um, when we have crops that come out early enough to allow that. And then otherwise, last year we also experimented with putting, um, we got a lot of burlap coffee sacks from Peace Coffee. Um, and it turns out those are, are Organic certified. Yeah, organic certified. So um, put those on the beds as well, um, just to kind of cover soil when we didn't have anything growing in there. Um, so yeah, these are, I know Carl, you had an awesome list and I think probably most of what we have here is on the list that you shared, um, but we just wanted to put up some of our personal favorites in terms of books, podcasts, um, groups, organizations, um, yeah, places to go for, questions, um, both big and small. Um, we had to put, there was a hawk that visited our farm last summer and we got a vole and mouse problem. So that was a, another kind of favorite farming resource. Um, that was pretty awesome to, to farm near. That is great. Yeah, I think um, one thing that we didn't mention in our, in our journey that was really um, helpful was um, we listed it here in the classes, but we did take the Land Stewardship Project's Farm Beginnings course. Uh, we took Farm Dreams and Farm Beginnings. Um, we took that in the winter of 2018 to 2019. So right before we, we found out we were pregnant during the course, um, right before we found California Street Farm. And so um, that's if you, you know, if you're not yet farming, you're considering farming more, you want to start a business. Um, it's a really helpful just um, exercise and, and obviously resource to understand better, you know, we set holistic goals of like, why do we want to do this? Um, it helped us be a little more granular in our planning of, you know, how can we sustain ourselves doing this? 
um, and, and would definitely recommend that was that was helpful for us figuring out you know where to begin and how to begin and and what kind of our strengths and weaknesses were. Yeah, I, I want to just jump in and say that that's really important. I mean, doing the work of growing really nice vegetables is hard enough and really important, but it's just one part of the whole thing. And uh, this goal setting and knowing who you are and, and the whole marketing piece and all of that, which takes a lot of time and effort. Um, and I say that because having spent my career working with farmers, farmers want to do stuff. And writing things down is not doing stuff, um, but it's so important. And I think that's what's really nice about that class. So we can um, we can stop sharing our screen and copy and paste the, those resources into the chat if they're helpful. Um, but we thought we would just open it up to conversation and questions if anybody has any. We haven't had our eyes on the chat, so we can cover anything that came up, if anything. But okay, hold on. There, I'll I'll start. Uh, you, lots of questions here. I'm really interested in no-till practices. Is something I'm really interested in. But uh, uh, Jake, maybe you can jump in here too with the sod. Um, he started with some grassed areas. I don't know if it was quack grass, but uh, he managed to, and I've done that too, and you end up with a pile of sod and it's really heavy. <laughs> and, uh, but he put it on Craigslist and boom, it disappeared. Um, so I thought that was pretty clever. Yeah, that is clever. I don't know that anybody would want the quack grass sod, but maybe worth trying. <laughs> Well, just we cut it real short first. So you don't have to tell them. <laughs> yeah, we had instead have a mound of sod on the edge of our farm that we call Burmy Sanders. Um, so that's another uh, approach. And, and was that a compost pile in the background on that one picture? I think Russ Henry had compost there. We we have a we have a kind of pallet um, two bay compost um, pile. It's not something that we use on the beds. Um, it's something that we have uh, just like used for a place to put vegetable scrap. Okay. Don't mind having close to the field. It would be our, it's our goal to more actively manage and build that compost pile this year. Although we have a kind of a bigger and better version at our house since that's where more of the like post-harvest handling greens can end up, so. Um, kind of two compost piles, two places, but. But for, for the farm, we we use cow's mow compost. We get a big order in the spring and then we cover it and kind of apply the bulk of it in the spring and then save some for when we're doing bed turns. We, we generally, this year we will be getting two crops out of almost every bed. Um, so we do try to turn over our beds and, and we, try to at least put compost down in between crops if there are you know heavy feeders coming in or things that we think will need a little more um, fertility. Katie, is there any other questions coming up? Um, yeah, Jordan has his hand raised. Yeah, so Ashley, Chris, a really nice presentation. That was a really nice overview of your operation. Um, so my question for you is, as I think about developing you know, this urban farm in a suburban environment, one aspect I, I can't quite get my head wrapped around is just the risk of vandalism and, and like theft. Um, uh, you know, I, I live in an area where I could imagine bored teenagers may want to take it upon themselves to uh, vandalize, right, the farm. But give me, you know, what insights do you have on, you know, do you, do you run into those issues in a urban setting? And if so, like, how do you mitigate you know, vandalism and, and theft. So I think first and foremost, like great fences make great neighbors. It's great to have a fence. Um, it is just kind of a barrier that people tend to respect. Um, I think we've had a couple of issues, minor issues. We had like some kids hop the fence and smash a couple of watermelons. Um, we had somebody smash a, a, a basket gourd that we were growing for fun at the end of the first season. Um, Generally, our approach has been to make friends with our neighbors. Um, you know, when the kids smashed the watermelons, we found out because one of our friends who lives across the street saw them and came over and shooed them away and then shot us a text um, and said, you know, just so you know, this is what, this is, what is happening. Um, we, we try to be 
you know, I think we're there a lot, which helps. Um, we are near a couple of like pretty well lit areas, um, which also helps, you know, we're right next to Botano Park, which has lights on at night and um, there are street lights around us. I think we've tried to kind of make it clear that this is a working farm. We have a very ugly no trespassing sign that we don't like, but probably does a little bit to, to ward off people who are um, maybe looking to kind of do some put their boredom somewhere <laughs> yeah it was it was there before we started farming and it was recommended that we keep it there so I don't know if folks before us had more problems than we've had but I think that if people are coming in and taking the vegetables for the most part it seems like they're doing it respectfully um and like if they're coming in to take the vegetables and they're not hurting the plants like that's okay um in our book so yeah we've only had a few kind of issues here and there yeah the yeah. kids pulled a bunch of carrots too and it was like our fall storage carrots which hurt a little bit but you know it happens yeah we, we've had a couple like i was crouching behind a tomato bush picking some tomatoes and somebody rode up on a bike and i think it was like fairly evident that he was looking to steal some vegetables and he asked if we had any cucumbers and we gave him some cucumbers you know and i think it's sort of you, you view that as the pay what you farm, pay what you can farm stand, and uh, and if people are, are stealing vegetables to eat them, yeah, more power to them, and and let's give them as many as we can. And if they're looking to make trouble, let's you know try to limit that as much as possible. Great, thank you. I think the pumpkins are a special case. Mm -hmm. uh, certain, I mean, we uh, young boys can't resist pumpkins. <laughs> we have definitely in our in our crop plan and our field map this year, we're trying to be strategic about what is at the north edge of the fence, which is like the most trafficked area, and then the east edge of the fence, which <laughs> is um, along the railroad tracks where, um, you know, some people traverse that direction too. So like watermelons are going to be <laughs> a little bit more set back. No one, no one's hopping a fence to steal Swiss chard, you know. <laughs> And I think there's an easy process. Like, this is not a free garden, but maybe if you you know, if you don't want to be nasty and tell people to go away, but uh, uh, it takes because there's community gardens too where people are allowed to do that. So, yeah, yeah I think in our experience, people have been much more anybody else than we would even have thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw Kirsten maybe asked if we have to cart in all the wash pack equipment, which is a, a great question. Um, we, we do. Um, we keep a limited amount of stuff at the field. So we have two um, plastic kind of tool shed kind of like vertical storage lockers that you might put in your garage. One of our friends was moving and gave them to us. So we have those locked with a padlock. If anybody wanted to bust in, they could. And we keep things like our, you know, our hose and rakes and broad forks there. Um, but the, you know, the wash tub, the tent, our tables. Harvest totes, tomato trays, like all that stuff is in our garage. And then we truck it to the field every. Every week, yeah, every twice week. a week. Yeah, which this year, um, unfortunately, but small, small silver lining, my uncle passed away and left us a truck. So that was a, um, a beautiful gift yeah. to add because before we were putting things in like the back of a Subaru, uh, which was not easy. Yeah. And it's the same for getting to market. So most of that stuff that we're washing and packing with is doing double duty. You know, our tent and our tables are, are coming to market and, and to the farm stand with us. So, um, we are also very lucky that our farm stand, or, or our farm is eight blocks north of our house and our market is about eight blocks south of our house. So um, we're never traveling very far and uh, we can kind of somewhat haphazardly load things in the back of a pickup and not worry about them bouncing off on the highway or uh, anything like that. Can I just follow up on that question? Um, do you guys see yourselves putting together like one of those trailers that you can just bring with you or park it or? Do you have any plans for something like that or like in your dreams what would you have to kind of make life even easier do you mean for equipment or for veggies equipment equipment or transporting veggies mm -hmm. either or 
I think probably from uh, like veggies and post-harvest handling perspective, we would love to like have a wash packs area on the farm um, that had like a more permanent structure that had placed a space to store some of that stuff just from like a food safety perspective and from a logistical perspective, um, you know, like dreaming big. It's like, it has a concrete floor and it drains well. And, you know, we don't have to walk 300 feet to turn on the water and turn it off when we, when the tub is full. Um, but yeah, I think that from the wash pack perspective and then the market per perspective, like what you see some of what we see some of the other farmers doing in terms of like a sprinter van that has, um, yeah, veggies and market equipment all kind of in one load. Cause right now it's very piecemeal for us just fitting it in two old vehicles. <laughs> So Kirsten has a couple more good ones, if we can just jump in, about sure. signage on the farm, in and around the farm, which is something that we've been talking a lot about this year. Um, so last year we had, so there, there's the no trespassing sign, um, my least favorite sign. Um, there was a really nice kind of like uh, Dremeled, I don't know, is it Dremeled or like? It's like CNC routed. Yeah, a routed California Street Farm wood yeah. sign that was there when we, we got, got the farm. It had been knocked over or had like rotted out. So last year we actually redug some holes and put it back up. Um, and we made a banner last year in 2019 actually that just has the farm and some of, and our logo on it and a couple of things we did. The, Which Minnesota um, Ground has a cost share program that will cover half of that. So if you're doing any kind of signage, yes, hooray, that's such an amazing program. Yeah. <laughs> take advantage of that for sure. But we're thinking about kind of revamping our signage for this year. Yeah, I think one of the things that we've been really surprised by, like not not planning on being urban growner, growers is just like how engaged the community is with what's happening and how observant people are in terms of like, this bed used to be something that looked like lettuce, like what's in here now? Um, and at the outset of the season, we posted just like a small kind of like taped in a Ziploc bag, um, eight and a half by 11 of like, what's this big plastic tarp on the field and tried to kind of communicate what we were trying to achieve with the silage tarp and people got into that. So it's our thought that um, this year we could hopefully do a little bit more just kind of like sharing of what we're growing on the farm, what we're doing on the farm. Um, and in an ideal world, put that in a couple languages um, to make it more accessible. And so that's, that's one thought we have um, for kind of, and streamlining that across channels like last year we were writing newsletters that were going out to like a list of folks but we only use that content in one place and once you're taking the time to write something down like that might as well put it up um, in a few other places yeah that was something that we we started doing last year i think because of covid basically we we hadn't been selling online we started selling online and we introduced a market card as well. And so in order to kind of prioritize or to, to promote that, we started doing a weekly newsletter um, and had a lot of people sign up. Um, you know, we had it on our website, we had it on a sign at the farm and um, that became an opportunity for us to talk to people. And we realized, you know, we, we could probably leverage this in a couple other places to talk to more people more regularly. And for emerging farmers, there's like so much value in just telling people your story. Like we've had people email us back from that list saying like, I have this leased land. Do you want it? Like it doesn't have water and it's not very good quality. So like, it, you know, it's a mixed bag, but people read that stuff. They really care and they want to support you. So like connecting with your community is a really amazing thing to do, even though it takes time. Like we would, Chris would write them at like Wednesday night at midnight, but worth it. <laughs> It's also a good opportunity for us to like reinforce with ourselves like why we're doing it and what we're what we're passionate about. You know, if if we can't speak about it to other people, like maybe we need to do a little bit more learning. Or um, it's an opportunity for us to kind of think about like why we do things the way we do beyond just that's the way that we've always done them. Um, you know, I think Red asked, "Has your interest or passion for farming changed now that you're running your own farm?" Which is like a a very good question. I don't even know if Red's still on the call, but you know, it's, oh yes. Yeah. Uh, I would say it has, but in like, in, a, in, in good ways, mostly, I think I, we've become very passionate about different things probably. Um, but I think especially the newsletter for me last year was a great opportunity to think about like, what are we passionate about and why are we doing this? And, you know, I think early on, if you had asked us, why do you want to be farmers? We would have said like, 
a big part of it would have been like having acreage in a rural setting to raise kids on. And that's still obviously a, you know, an important part of our vision or it's something that we, we are interested in, but there are a lot of other things that have come to the forefront of like why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, speaking for me personally, it, it is so much work and it's so physically demanding. There are moments, like I still have the childlike glee for like putting seeds in the soil, but then at some point in August, I'm like, holy moly, you you can definitely lose some of the magic. And like knowing and talking to farmers who've been doing it for seven years, 10 years, like I think that that burnout is super real and it's something we're really conscious of. And like, I had a design career that I did for 10 years and kind of hit that same wall. So I'm I think we're both aware of it as a risk and not wanting to like kill something we love just because we want to make a living from it. It's like, it's such a dance. It's like, I love it so much. I want to do it all the time. Well, to do it all the time, we need to, you know, make it into a certain kind of business or enterprise or something. So it's, it's a really tricky line to walk. Yeah. Ashley mentioned earlier that we're like really risk averse. And um, I think that is like, comes through in the way that we've done what we've done. Like we are, taking very measured steps towards that kind of full-time farming goal uh, and trying to kind of do it. One of our you know holistic goals is to do it in as low a stress way as possible, which like tell that to us in the middle of late July. And we would like laugh in your face because we're so stressed out probably. But um, I think, you know, in the broader picture, we're trying to make this as fun as possible and, and, and remember that like in the grand scheme of things, like it, it we're doing it because we love it and not because, you know, we need to do it um, and try to keep it in that, in that kind of, in that perspective, I guess. I think um, Tom asked a couple questions about living off the land and farming and, and things like that, which are, which are good ones and kind of all play into that, that idea. I don't know if you want to talk about our like long-term plan. I don't know. <laughs> We, I mean, we've kind of stepped out like five years in the future. What would it take from an income perspective for us to, you know, live entirely off of farming um, from, you know, what are our monthly expenses and annual expenses to like, what is childcare going to cost us? And, um, you know, where are we going, what are we going to be paying, you know, for land and have tried to kind of figure out, okay, how can we, you know, how big does our business need to be and, and how, um, how, how stressful would that be? How much yeah. land do we need to support it? I mean, and I think that like one of the biggest things we've learned as we crunch the numbers again and again is like the purchase price of a piece of land or property is such a big driving factor because like if you're if you have a mortgage to hit every month and if that mortgage is big or sort of big, um, it, it's not going to go away for a while or for a very long time or forever. Um, so just like, yeah, I think in penciling the numbers out for us, for what we need to live on. And um, it, it, at least in the five-year timeline, it's like, we're gonna have to keep off farm jobs, at least in some capacity because of things like health insurance. And I hope that I hope that we can like think differently and get out of that. And at the same time, I think that like off farm jobs might provide a nice balance. Um, maybe I'm convincing myself of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've talked about like off farm and off season um, and, and being on farm full time in, in season. And that seems like potentially reasonable if you can find the right off season work. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. And it's uh, almost all farmers or all farm households, put it that way, have off farm income. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like 85% or something. Yeah. And, uh, and so this is a, this is a huge challenge. Um, uh, you know, years ago when I was working out in rural Wisconsin, you know, the, the spouses would work at the courthouse uh, and health insurance. Who knew? Retirement. These are nice things to have. Um, if we could get that figured out for small businesses like farms, we would make some headway. But uh, the, the land price, land access thing is a huge conundrum. Um, and, and, it, and part of it comes down to... Uh, in my mind, do you enjoy planting the seeds and digging compost? And there's no way of getting away from any kind of farming being a lot of hard work. And uh, when I used to work on farms years ago, bucking hay bales, picking rock, you know, just miserable hard work. We would just say, oh, you gotta love it. So it's not for everybody. 
but the so I think there's a balance between uh, you know if you go the normal route you get big and you hire people and you take on way more than land debt all kinds of labor saving machinery and and you can do that and people do uh, but maybe there's some kind of middle route we can figure out I mean you definitely need some scale I believe and some uh, equipment that really speeds things up um, but uh, I think overall in American agriculture, we've just done such a terrible job figuring out the life cycle of a farm. And uh, uh, so, I, and I think uh, you're not alone in trying to figure this one out, right? Yeah. The cheapest land is way out there somewhere, but there's no markets out there for, mm -hmm. for, for what you want to do. We've been somewhat heartened in reading, at least I have, I should speak for myself, um, in reading the no-till farming book. Um, sounds like, I mean, every book, when you read it, you're like, that sounds like a great model. Um, but it does seem like a very great, like human powered model, at least for the type of farming we aspire to be doing. Um, Which one is that? Is that the- uh... The new Daniel Mays book, it's called- uh... Yeah, I think I just bought that and I haven't read it yet. No-till no organic vegetable farm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it ties into the whole soil health. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yep, yeah, I am uh, looking forward to reading that. And so you guys, uh, you, you had on your slide no-till. What are, how do you do the no-till with veggies? What are some of the things you're trying? Yeah, so we, at least in terms of bed prep now, once once beds are built for the first time, we may broad fork them once a season if needed, but otherwise um, we're just doing kind of light raking on the surface to incorporate compost and amendments. Um, and then, like I said, it's, it's mostly about like keeping the soil covered as much as possible, ideally with living plant matter. Um, and when not, we're using things like burlap sacks or cardboard boxes or like literally whatever we can get our hands on. Um, this fall, we put a bunch of um, dried leaves and ran the lawnmower over them on top of the beds just to cover any places that didn't have cover crops. So um, trying to just kind of be creative about what we're doing to, yeah, to minimize disturbance. Yeah. I think if there's new stuff we're trying this year. Um, more like living mulches. We do use a little bit of landscape fabric and plastic mulch. Um, in some ways it's nice for like those new beds we built where we still have more weed pressure. Um, but I think when possible, we'd love to like get a little bit more straw. Um, straw is expensive, especially in an urban environment. So if anyone has a good source for that, we like, when we go out and visit Nick and Joan in Litchfield, we stop at a farm in Hutch and like fill our car with straw. But if anyone has a good source for that, like that's, that's a challenge. Um, I know we yeah. should work on that. Um, you get those little teeny bales for 10 bucks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. adds up. You get all you want out in the country, tight, big bales for three bucks. It's yeah. just all about the transportation, but we ought to be able to figure something out. Yeah. That's a big one. Anybody else? Have, anybody just jump in? Uh, any questions? I guess the one other no-till thing we're doing, which is like maybe not new news, but um, we learned about it from Singing Frogs, which is out west in California, is just leaving the roots in the soil. So even when we're harvesting crops, cutting them at soil level um, or letting them flower if we can. So like cilantro, letting that kind of flower and go to seed. Monster. Even, yeah, brassicas, which it sometimes makes the farm feel really sloppy. <laughs> Um, but I know that it's good. So we do that. But then even things like fennel this year, we cut it at um, when we were harvesting, obviously cut things clear, but didn't pull the roots out. And then we actually got small bulbs to come out of where we had topped each root. And I think we interplanted lettuce, but went back and harvested the like tiny mini baby fennel and bunched it and sold it. And it was like an amazing win-win of like intercropping and not disturbing soil. So it was weird. And we were like, can we do this? But it worked. And customers loved it. Yeah. People were like, mini fennel is so good. I've never had it before. We're like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Neither had we, but. Um, Tom asked if we grow much of our own food. We grow um, pretty much entirely all of our own produce for the year. Um, we have two chest freezers. We do a lot of canning. Um, we buy in, I mean, with the, with, with the little one, we buy in some fruits and um, last year we bought in some onions and winter squash from a couple other farms just because we wanted a little more diversity in our winter squash and we wanted, our, our onion crop was not big enough to 
provide enough onions for us for the year, but um, pretty much other than that, produce wise, yeah, we, we look like real weirdos when we go to the co-op because all we're buying is like the most dairy and bread products. <laughs> they must think we eat very unhealthily. <laughs> we do have four chickens at home too, which is a nice source for some of our um, veggie waste from the farm and a good source of eggs. Excellent. Um, Could you tell us some about the, the pay what you can farm stand and how that works? Yeah, so we're, it's something we want to talk more about this year and, and hopefully talk to some customers um, and get their perspective on what would be kind of like least awkward, least stigmatized, whatever it is. But this year we basically ran it as like we posted the same prices that we had at the market on Saturday in part to like kind of keep things consistent. Um, and then as people kind of gathered their producers, we gathered it for them. We would just give them a suggested price at the end um, and try to just verbally encourage people to, to do whatever they were feeling comfortable with. And I, I think that worked okay, but I'm aware of like that that probably still feels like it puts pressure on people. And I know that like some customers would outright be like, this is my stimulus check, but I'm giving it to you because you work hard, which like feels very good. And at the same time, it's like, but <laughs> we want to share with you. Um, so, I'm not sure, like maybe next year we'll do a, a like range of prices or just like more openly communicate that um, it's okay to give us, you know, any number, especially because the the neighborhood support for it was so strong last year. Um, it was really neat to see. We did also last year offer um, pre-orders for both the market and the farm stand online. Um, and we had a discount code on the website that was just pay as you can and or pay what you can and would make the purchase free. Um, so people could basically reserve their veggies, come pick them up. We had some people pick them up and not pay anything. We had some people pick them up and give us, you know, 10 or 15 bucks for a $20 order. Um, so that I think was a, I think was a little bit telling to what Ashley's kind of pointing out that like when the stigma of the interaction is removed, people were a little more likely to kind of take advantage of it in a more, um, kind of in, in a larger way. So how can we do, replicate that at the stand? Yeah, we thought about just like a cash box or something that people could just like put whatever they want to in. Um, so yeah, we're, we're exploring other models and if, if other people know of different ways to do it, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, Julia, uh, maybe you could chime in here and tell us about the uh, Urban Ventures uh, how you guys go about it. Yeah, so, well, what we did was we labeled each product with a limit number, because I think the majority of our customers were paying less than like the average market price. So we didn't even post prices, we just put limits on things. So like you can take four tomatoes, two cucumbers, because we would kind of estimate how many people typically come to the stand and then make a limit to make sure all those people will get some produce when they do come. And we had maybe, we had like one sixth of the income we used to make when we did charge for each product. Um, yeah, it was kind of crazy, but like we're a nonprofit, so uh, you guys probably like it wouldn't really make sense to do it that way, but that was effective in kind of balancing like we want everyone who comes to still have things because if you just put a big sign that says free, only the first five people are going to get vegetables. So it's like balancing getting the word out, but like reining it in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And uh, Urban <laughs> Ventures is over there in the Phillips neighborhood. Yeah, we're also looking into, we, we can accept SNAP and EBT at the market through the market. And we're looking into whether we can get approved to do that at the stand, which I think would be really awesome. Um, there was a, a link that went out on Sustag recently about grants for farms and farmers markets to accept it. So we've applied. I don't know if we qualify because we are a one stall stand, but um, we'll see. Yeah, I think 
we when we were charging prices we were able to accept snap and we were a same like we were a farm stand not a farmer's market so you definitely would be eligible and yeah we had a lot of people coming this year that said like oh i want to i want to give you my snap benefits or like i want to use my ebt card but we were just doing cash because we were just doing pay as variable so i think that would be definitely like an awesome step Oh yeah, so other thing I was gonna say, we did, you mentioned potentially doing like a cash box. So that is what we were doing. Like at the end, we had a box that was labeled donations. And before people started shopping, we let them know like, you can pay as much as you'd like to pay. And we gave a suggestion of like five or $10 per bag of produce they took. Mm -hmm. so we said like, you do not have to pay anything. We said like, if you pay $0, that is fine. And we made sure like they understood that. And then we just had the box at the end and like someone was sitting near it kind of watching it, but they weren't handling the money that the person gave to us. So they could just slip in whatever they wanted to. So a lot of people just gave a few dollars or they were just paying in single bills. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, that's super helpful. Yeah. yeah. Lorna had a good advice about finding straw at uh, strawberry farms. Yeah, I saw that. And then the parks. Um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the person who posted that. Rebecca. Um, thank you both for those suggestions. And uh, I'm working with uh, Stephanie Hankerson, uh, trying to explore cardboard. Can we use cardboard for mulch and uh, compost? Um, and uh, where can you source a bunch of cardboard and how you, can you grind it up and those kinds of questions. Uh, but you did, you did like the lasagna method thing where you just lay the cardboard down, right? Mm -hmm. And then put and I, the stuff on top. And I think that would have worked better if two things were true. One, if we didn't have such a bad quack, quack grass problem and two, if we had thicker layers of compost on top of it. I think we like sort of ran out as we got towards the end. Um, what's the name of the farm? The farmer is like Ricky. Oh something. yeah, it's a uh, Seven Songs Farm. I seven think. Songs Farm. They have they have at least is a YouTube video. Is that? No, no, it's not. Hold on, um, I'll look it up. It's a farmer who puts cardboard down all the time and like swears by it, and it's it's pretty interesting to look at. If he does bigger plants like tomatoes, he'll like cut a hole in the cardboard, put compost at the bottom of the hole, and then put the um, put solid the, seeds of solidarity farm. Yes. Well, I've done that, uh, it's that lasagna thing, but I, I've also done it with like three feet of hay, mm -hmm. put it in fall and actually I have some, let me use a spring, you know, just right on top of quack grass, quack grass it was. Um, so there's different things. So if anybody has an idea about using cardboard, uh, we're gonna be uh, hopefully uh, doing some research, you know, informal research on that. <laughs> Yeah, we, we put it down in the fall just like to literally cover the soil. And I'm kind of curious to see what happens. In some instances, I put some leaves on top if we had them, but I was just literally trying to cover any bare ground on the on the farm. So I'm curious to see kind of what happens as we as the snow melts in the spring. Our experience last year was that it I was always paranoid that it wasn't gonna break down quickly enough and the roots yeah. didn't have trouble going through. And that was never like as soon as it rained one time, you could like punch your finger through without any issues. So right when it gets wet, it pretty much. So what do you dumpster dive for your cardboard, or where do you get it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which we use only cardboard that doesn't have um, colored ink on it. And so anything that's like unprinted. And all the tape and all the coatings and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, we um, we have a huge cardboard box um, that our that our son loves to play in right now. That will, I'm sure, end up on the farm that we found from a neighbor's house. So, yeah, excellent. Always on the lookout for big pieces of cardboard. Yeah. So we're getting towards the end of the half hour here. It, maybe. Uh, uh, so, what are the plans for this year, and uh, how's it looking? And COVID's still going to be around till at least later this summer. So we're not done yet. People are getting antsy, but. So, and this has been a great plus for a lot of local producers. How can we grab onto that and keep it? 
Yeah, I think that's totally true. Last year, over the year before, we just so much more foot tra traffic by the farm, so much more engagement, um, so many more people at the farmers market. So we're hoping that that trend continues, um, and not just from a like can we sell vegetables perspective, but just from a general kind of movement and people rediscovering the joy of walking in the neighborhood and buying from a farmer's market. So um, yeah, our hope is that demand keeps up and we're gonna try and grow some more this year and see what happens. Yeah, we're trying to add another like 15% output to the farm this year and building a few new beds and trying to move crops through as quickly as possible while still yeah, doing those experiments and cover crop and stuff like that. Um, have you ever tried buckwheat for, for short? We have not because we've been a little bit nervous about termination. Although someone, we were on the soil health webinar the other, or cover cropping webinar the other night, and someone was just talking about pulling it out with your hands. And I was like, well, that's a great backup plan at our scale. So I think we will try and where we have any holes in the spring um, or summer, if we've got a month window, we'll try and drop it in. Um, I don't know if that's a backup plan or a sore back plan, but right. But it's it's pretty succulent. We um, typically have only used oats and peas just because we're yeah. we're sowing them later in the season, and we wanted something that could winter kill. Although we also heard about crimson clover as an idea of something that is we're, a clover. Yeah, that I think we're going to try underselling our kale and maybe a few other places. But again, it's like a little wary, but we'll see. Give it a try. Yeah. All right. Well, um, uh, anybody else have some uh, further thoughts or questions or any uh, emerging farmers conference coming up this week? Um, uh, Same farming conference is coming up. The Growing Together Moses Grassworks conglomeration of the conference is coming up. Um, so check those out. Uh, let's see, Lorna said. Cedar trees. Uh, so oh, there's Lorna's your talking about um, wood chips. We also there's a there's a pile actually in Northeast um, that's free. It's the city's pile up towards Columbia Heights um, that we just stumbled upon. It's like a because we looked into chip drop and getting a lot of um, we were going to put wood chips along the fence just to kind of help with the not having to like weed whack the fence. And we might put them in walking rows this year. We're gonna yeah and. Um, yeah, apparently there's just like a big pile in Northeast where the city, the city used to have a couple of dumping sites. Now they bring them all here. So um, we've gotten a few trucks full from there, you know, for our home beds and then for our raspberries and things like that. That's another option. There is that service too, free. They've got a humorous website. Yeah, uh, chip, chip drop. But you don't know what you're gonna get or when you're gonna get it, <laughs> but it's yeah. free. We, we put in for that last year and they never contacted us. Although our neighbors down the street just got one, oh, that's so hard. it does it does work. But you can end up with a huge pile, yeah. which for you guys wouldn't be so bad. But if you wanted a few little wheelbarrows around your petunias. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're getting towards the end. We can keep chatting if people want. But um, at this point, I want to thank you very much. And uh, it seems like you... Uh, have really thought about this and, and uh, are continuing to think about it. These farms are always a, a work in progress, but it looks really nice. Um, and I wish you all the luck and, and hopefully maybe this fall we can check it out. Uh, we'll see how the vaccine rolls out and all that. Uh, but that was the whole idea of this network is to actually get together. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I will, uh, as always, collect all the emails. Um, and uh, uh, thank you, Kylie. And uh, 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 also, if you have any ideas or things you'd like to, farmers you'd like to see or for this network, um, I'm always uh, open to suggestions. Check out our website. It needs a little organization now because uh, I'm no webmaster, but I get to do it. Um, what else? Yeah, check out the conferences. Um, and thank you, Katie and uh, Kylie. Keep in touch, man. Uh, let me know when you're back in the cities. Uh, Kylie Farms down in Georgia. Uh, Will do. And uh, hey, Kylie.
maybe we'll do a session on the uh, Southern Farmers Co-op. Okay. That would be fun. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. And Jake, keep keep me in touch with uh, what you got going on this year, and uh, we'll just keep growing and sharing together. Um, all right, man. Thank you. So uh, I guess I'll uh, we'll call it a day. And thank you, thank you all again. And uh, we'll just uh, keep good food in the neighborhood and, uh, and uh, keep working together. And really what we're doing is redefining agriculture. So thank you so much Saturday. and have a great day. Thank you all. Thanks a lot, Chris, Ashley. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Carl. Really wonderful. This is great. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Carl. That was great. We'll right. do it again.